Thank you, SFA. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be here and to get to judge, which we got to do again this year. Um, I'm going to run through. There could be a couple different slides that um, may not belong due to time, but we're going to get there as best we can. So real quick, I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit who I am. And thank you, Sarah. I already told you guys from uh, Dutch Eatery and Harry Nida's, which are two restaurants here in the East Village, very small. But I would say definitely disruptive in the food scene. Um, we are great at having one-hit wonders, which uh, I'll tell you about in a second. Um, so this is my presentation, The Future of Alternative Meat. Um, I just felt like more people will come if I say that. Um, it's, also, it's also sequentially titled... Um, hold on. Meat tastes good and so do other things. Um, so, real quick, I'll just tell you guys, am I supposed to be aiming somewhere? Okay. Um, so I'll tell you guys a little bit just about me. My grandparents on both sides were chefs. Uh, so I really grew up very much in the food world. My grandmother, a French trained chef and grandfather, a fisherman in the Orient, Long Island, all the way on the tip of the North Fork. And my other grandparents had a Jewish delicatessen. Um, my places are predominantly famous for meat. I've won... Best brisket in America, best brisket in New York, best pastrami in New York, all sorts of crazy, crazy things. Actually, our first restaurant, Taxiri, is known for a smoked goat neck, as weird as that sounds. And when we first opened, we were on every Guy Fiore show you could ever possibly imagine. So it, I say this not to brag, but I say it because it puts me in a little bit different perspective when it comes to fake meat and having that conversation. Um, my background especially is in food preservation. So what this is, and I'll go through this in a little bit, is looking into the past and figuring out ways and the science behind ways we preserve food. And that could be from pickling something to fermenting something to curing things in high alkalinity uh, to smoking things, um, anything you can imagine. And so and we also actually have... I can't do a presentation without putting in one half slide of mushrooms because we're crazy, crazy mycology people as well. Um, and we actually just wrote, like Sarah said, a book on it called Salt, Smoke, and Time, which is all about food preservation uh, with Harper Collins. Um, this is uh, smoked scallops with black garlic that we make ourselves. It's really, really good. Um, this is Doc's Eatery. These are small, small, old restaurants uh, right in the East Village. And this is, hold on, Harry and Ida's. It's even called Meat and Supply. We were on the front page in two full pages of the New York Times when we opened as greatest pastrami in New York City. So we really do know our meat. This is the front of it. And in the back, we actually have a small food lab where we actually work on a lot of these ideas and bringing them up to date. Um, so as I was saying, our main focus is on meat and smoked meat. And this became the bread and butter of what we used to do. That's the goat neck in the middle um, to all sorts of different things and, and companies that we've started in the past. And this was great, but a little bit about my background before all this, I actually attended Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado which is a Buddhist university, for permaculture and sustainability. So as this was all fantastic, um, so much about where I come from originally was actually very much adverse to this, let alone the fact that my father was also chief of cardiology at Beth Israel for 25 years. So when we first opened Ducks, we had a funny joke that, that we would staple his business card to the receipts. He it was funny for us, not for him. Um, <laughs> Hold on. So, I'm not going to go through all the different details of protein and animal-based protein. And there's enormous different groups of scientists and researchers and people in medicine that will argue for protein and that we have to have higher, higher di diets of protein. Of course, you know, people like Atkins, obviously, we all know that, you know, had multiple bouts with cardiovascular disease. Not a lot of people really separate whether we're talking about animal protein or plant-based protein. Um, 
which is dramatically different. And all these things have been kind of really pumped into my head for years and years and years. I wanted to try to, at least while still being responsible to my businesses, try to change paths and change directions, let alone the obvious points environmentally. And that's truthfully what cared to me, uh, I cared about most. Um, and the trajectory that we're at with a meat-centric diet. So I started doing a couple things and also, I just love throwing something in about blue zones. I'm sure everyone knows about blue zones, but um, you know these are the places in the world studied where we have seen the highest longevity um, and health in the, in life. And so, trying to there's been lots of great people have talked about this, like Michael Pollan and such. And some of the things that are most interesting to me, um, besides the fact that everyone talks about blue zone diets, is that so much of the is, is of it is actually social being able to have communities and social interaction and how we, you know, treat our elderly. But enormous amount is also the little to no lack of processed foods. So the first thing I did was I came up with the idea to how do we create more value out of seaweed. Um, so I started a company originally called Akua. Um, I'm not sure if they're here today, but um, this we were processing uh, seaweed and mushrooms to be like jerky and so if anyone's aware of seaweed and how incredible it is it's the absolute future and it's for another time I could tell you about how it's going to save the universe um, and mushrooms but it was fantastic and, and I really really enjoyed doing it but one thing that was adverse my background as being a chef was that we were just focusing on processing something on making something look like something else. Um, or I shouldn't say look like something else, but we are really, you know, you're, when you look at alternative meats right now, and we're gonna go into it, it's, I feel like it's a matter of making Frankenstein alive. And and, and that's what, to me, I, I'm not, I'm against as a chef. And when you look at the majority of all the fake meats out there right now, we are looking at things that are essentially just either soy or pea protein and unsustainably from coconut fat. And for me running a restaurant in New York City and for pretty much every other chef that's done anything in the modes of slow foods and heritage techniques for the past 20, 30, 40 years, this is fucking ridiculous. We're all mad. We have to have a company, we have to pour half a billion dollars to have a company make plants look like they bleed so we can convince people to eat it? <laughs> it's, it's so crazy and the truth of the matter is is that this is all just stems itself from the same line of thought that we had in the 80s when we decided that we we're going to take this beautiful, beautiful, delicate technique of things like tofu and add it to a bunch of really crappy stir fries and, to and tofu chilies. And this is the same idea that we have to find a replacement. It's all about finding a replacement. So for me, trying to find the answer to this that I could connect to as a chef was crucially, crucially important. And so much of what I write about and do is looking at the history and looking at food waste, looking at um, heritage techniques of how do we take something that isn't worth much and how do we add value to it. This idea that food waste is a modern invention. How do we take things and through process make them into something great? And Jonathan said something great, which is none of this matters if we're not making something delicious. And this is the core value of added value products, which is let's make something that someone doesn't have use for delicious. So I started, I'm going to zip through a little bit of this, but I started looking at whole plants in a new light with this understanding. And I started looking at, after studying all these years, how I treat meat and barbecue and charcuterie and cheese making, and I started taking the same idea to plants. I started with a radish. Actually, I started with a lot of root vegetables, but this is the only one I took pictures of three years ago. And I took a oversized watermelon radish that was practically being given away by one of my farmers at the farmer's market. And I started fermenting it. I started hanging it. I started doing very similar things that I've been doing for the past decade and a half to meat. And next thing you know, we got on the right here, which is what well, we called it just for fun, a radish prosciutto. And what I actually did was I actually entered a famous charcuterie contest 
and I previously won and was known for with meat, and I entered it with a rash and told everyone it was a fermented and smoked Rougarou Brajole. They called me up three three months later, the morning of the competition, and I said, listen, well, um, we, we wikipedia uh we Wikipedia, and it's telling us that it is a mythical swamp ghost from Louisiana. I said, okay, well, just go with me. It's the morning of the competition, so you can't do anything about it now. It's too late. And they went with it. And lo and behold, we got second place in the fucking competition, convincing a whole lot of incredibly smart meat people that what we had served them was meat. So this, this had a lot of implications to it. That I want to start a vegetable charcuterie business, I'm not sure where we could go with this. Either way, it was fun. And, and we really did that by had straw bales there and the old-fashioned prosciutto slicer that I stole from a restaurant's bathroom. It was Luckily, we were friends with, though we never gave back. And, um, and it was really awesome. So from there, we started doing things with fruit. Now, has anyone ever seen a watermelon ham on the internet? We got 120 plus million views on the internet. All because it looked like fucking ham. Um, this was really interesting because we started playing, and before this we actually don't talk about much, but it was on ABC, The Chew, and a bunch of other th programs, was a smoked cantaloupe burger. We started playing with things with higher water activity because what we couldn't replace with root vegetables is that feeling of fat, of that mouthfeel of fat. And it's the same problems that, that all these big companies are facing now, which is why they have a ton of coconut fat in them. Um, but when we figured out a way to stiffen up with high alkalinity, higher water activity fruit, we could actually create the mouthfeel. So we did this ham, and it went absolutely berserk. We got every single morning show, every newspaper, everything you could possibly talk about, every trend of the stupid year. And here we are, I won't go back to the picture, but we're like a 600 square foot restaurant in the East Village. And we're getting calls from, still to this day, I haven't served the worm on ham for six months, and we still get calls and emails every single day from every country imaginable saying they want to send their film crew to film this. Even, even to my mom's dismay, we were on Fox News. <laughs> this is really, this is fantastic. So, we actually had, I won't say what they say in Spanish, but Donald, never mind. We had some good shirts on that we pulled off after. They didn't like it. Um, so this was interesting. And, and the whole point of this, really for us, oh my god, I'm not going. My cut off. The whole point of this was to make vegetables the star of the show. And to re-examine what we were thinking. No, do we want to open up a smoked watermelon stand around the world? No, we have zero interest in doing that. In fact, I really have no interest in ever seeing that thing again. But can this open doors to how we view vegetables? Does everything have to be a hamburger or at least kind of be its own thing? Do we need to have, can we have smoked vegetables or cured vegetables the same way we have pickles? You know, we don't expect our, our smoked salmon locks to taste like our smoked ribs and our smoked brisket to taste like our locks. We can also have smoked vegetables or cured or do these same techniques and re-examine as a culture how we view plant-based food altogether. And do we need to spend a half a billion dollars on making it look like it fucking bleeds? And so with that, we also have a hot dog. And if anyone knows who that is, I can't, I'm not supposed to really be sharing this picture, but that is the hot dogging champion of the world who we're about to start a big campaign with, with a carrot that we made to, to actually snap and taste like a encased meat, like actual hot dog. That's my one of our smokers. And I think that's it. But actually, so these are some of the products we're now creating and working with actually, we have a big release coming out right now and one of them with a really great fast food company. And, um, and the whole premise is can we make these the star of their own show? Thank you, guys.